How are you? It's nice to see you in blue. You all just look like blue heads from up here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Jason Levine, and uh, oh, and you know what? We, um, we neglected to test sound, <laughs> which is challenging, because this is an audio class. So I'm just going to plug in the sound. Probably, probably appropriate. Oh, that's a good sound. Now we got, we got some stuff. Um, so we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different things, um, all of which follow directly everything that was listed in the description of this class today, uh, focusing a lot on using the Essential Sound uh, panel in Premiere Pro and Audition, which include things like auto level matching, which is probably one of my favorite and most useful features, whether you're an audio pro or just someone who's starting out, because it takes the pain away from trying to uh, automatically match the apparent loudness of different types of audio tracks. For instance, I'm someone who speaks all the time. I do voiceover all the time. Sounds like I'm doing one right now. So my, <laughs> so my delivery is very consistent, right? You might say on stage, of course, it gets very loud at times, but when I'm just talking or like in a scene, very consistent. Not everyone is as consistent. So, right, different voices, different tonalities, um, all have different apparent loudness levels. So when you're mixing, say, dialogue, um, uh, this can get challenging, right? Especially if you're doing like a two shot or an interview. So this will take care of that. This will also allow you to equalize all of your music tracks. So if you have some backing music, background tracks that are, say, sort of chill, ambient, just underscore in the background, but then you have something that's kind of rocking at the beginning, their apparent loudness will also be different. So um, Automatch is going to take care of that. We're also going to cover uh, noise reduction, uh, de-hum, a little bit of EQ. Also going to focus on um, this new de-reverb effect. So this just got released on Monday. Woohoo! Now, I'm going to tell you when we get there, um, very honestly, about how these things are supposed to work. Uh, de-reverb has and always has been kind of the holy grail of request, right? Something like this room. It's echoey. Uh, it's very ambient, and someone might be capturing me from the back over there, and it's not clear enough. So I'm going to show you and talk to you and really educate you on how these things are meant to be used and where they succeed. They don't succeed everywhere, okay? So this is not a, mar by the way, this is not marketing. Uh, this is full-on nerd learning. All right? Super oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Someone once said, I, I'll share this with all of you because we have some time and I feel like we're friends already. Someone once said to me, my very first Max, 12, 15 years ago, <laughs> and I didn't know what Max was at the time, and anyone who was here knows it was very uh, much developers at the time, and I didn't realize that, so I went in kind of like you saw me on Monday, <sighs> and all the comments were, uh, more info, less show. So. They, they, no, I'll tell you what, they were right, okay? So that's why I'm very serious. This is not marketing. I've been an audio engineer for 30 years. I take this stuff very seriously, and I want to educate you, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. So this is a piece, uh, a film called The Scene Between. Uh, we showed this at NAB earlier this year. Um, this is a nice mix of a typical sort of documentary-style edit where we have some dialogue, we have some music, and we have some sound design and or ambience, all right? So let's just play a little bit of this back, and maybe in the back there you might want to adjust the output levels. Yeah, I, it's weird. Like, I've, I've always struggled with self-doubt. All these, these questions about, like, oh, are you enough? Uh, what are you going to do with your life? Okay, cool. All right, so we're going to just dive right in. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Essential Sound, there's a couple ways you can access it. I love the new workspaces. You can see I've got about a dozen plus here. A lot of them are customized. From within Premiere Pro, if you choose Essential Sound, that's going to pull up the Essential Sound panel. The Essential Sound panel was designed to allow non-audio professionals the ability to mix all of the common types of audio with minimal controls. You have all the power behind hidden in the effects panel, but you don't have to see any of that. And there's a whole bunch of Adobe Sensei um, AI happening in several of the filters in here that really just do the work for you. So the first thing we're going to show uh, and I'm going to talk about is selecting the type of audio you want to work with. So if you take a look here, you'll see 
that part of the joy of this is that you just need to tell essential sound, what are you doing? What am I working on? So we're going to start with the dialogue, okay? The, the mix, this is unmixed, so it just, I, I just adjusted the levels ever so slightly here, but we don't have any ramps, we don't have any keyframed anything, and the dialogue needs to be pushed forward and just universally a little bit louder. This is another good example of, even when you're capturing someone, a singular person, even like myself, you know, you might have some parts that are fairly consistent looking like you see here, but then he gets quieter, right? You know, sensitive moment, emotional moment, you get quieter. It also depends, is he on a lav, is he on a boom mic? How is it being captured? So we want to effectively, and I say equalize, I don't mean using equalization, but make all of that audio the same apparent loudness, right? The peak levels may differ. Are we all familiar with the difference between peak and loudness? Yes. Yes, okay, awesome. So peak levels may be different. We're not worried about that. In fact, primarily, really, today, the peak is, it doesn't really matter. Um, what we are more concerned with is that apparent loudness. Is everything fairly consistent? Anyone today knows you don't want your dialogue or whatever that main carrier of your message or your story is to go in and out. One, because it just drives people crazy, and two, because they'll miss the message. So the first thing we need to do is tell Essential Sound, what are we working on? So I'm going to select all of the dialogue clips here. I'm also going to solo this track. I'm going to come up and choose Dialogue. Now when I do that, what Essential Sound does is it reveals all of the common filters and effects that you would use as a pro mixer to process dialogue. The first being loudness. All right? So we have a button here called Auto Match. One click, all right? and you can take a look if you're just paying attention to the audio down below. I'm going to click on Auto Match. One click automatically readjusts all of the loudness of all of those dialogue clips to a target level of minus 23 LUFS. That stands for, for those of you who don't know, loudness units relative to full scale. This is the new loudness measurement that we use today. Many of you will be familiar with DB, DBFS. That still exists, but DBFS is kind of the old standard. Because today, whether you're going to broadcast television, whether you're going to YouTube, whether you're going to Netflix, or you're just making Snapchat or Instagram stories, it's not about, it's not about decibels and peaks. It's really about that apparent average listening level. That's what LUFS is, re is referencing. And minus 23 happens to also be the ITU BTR 1770-3 standard for the US. Nerd alert. So, um, all right. So it does this automatically. So if I just wind this back now. Yeah, I, it's weird. Like, I've, I've always struggled with self-doubt. OK. It's all present now. Now, something that the mixer had in here, he was like increasing everything by 4 dB. So we're going to bring this back down below 0. I usually like to set all of my faders, by the way, at around minus 3 to minus 6 when I start. This wasn't my mix, so that's why it was peaking out like that. Let's go ahead and put the music back in there now and just take a listen. Yeah, I, it's weird. Like, I've, I've always struggled with self-doubt, right? It's present. It's all All there. these these questions about, like, oh, like, are you enough? Uh, what are you going to do with your life? Right? It just pushed everything forward. It's consistent. And it also happens to follow a broadcast standard. That's actually immaterial for this. Typically, you would do something like you're worried about that at the end, right? That's really the delivery. But the point is, as you can see visually, is that now all of this dialogue has that same loudness level. I don't care what you do. I don't care what kind of stuff you work on. This is, this is essential. This is so great, especially if you have multiple speakers, right? Multiple speakers, select all of your dialogue, auto-match. Now everything is the same level. You're not having to, how many of you draw keyframes all the time? Lots of blue hands. This is what we've been doing forever, right? Now, you can use a compressor, little subtext for you, right? This is learning. Do you guys mind detail? Are you okay with that? Okay, a little parenthetical detail. So you can also, in lieu of using auto match, traditional techniques, you can use a compressor, right? You can compress the audio, and then you can use makeup gain to supplement uh, any lost gain. I'm just going to point this out to you. If you go under Amplitude and Compression, we have a reimagined 
dynamics effect. This is something that's been in Premiere forever. Uh, it was licensed from another company 15 years ago. It was fine, but it was old, and the algorithm wasn't so great, and it just didn't sound very good. We redesigned this effect. Um, this is a very wonderful sounding compressor, expander, limiter, and gate. And I just point this out here, I know that wasn't in the description, because a gate is used to silence sections when someone isn't talking. All right. Now this is already cut up, so there's no silence in here. Uh, you'll even see that we have presets for things like noise gate or auto gate. I will also point out that if you go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jason Levine video, I have an eight minute video on auto gating, how you set it up, how you set up a manual compressor. That wasn't in the description today, so we're not going to get into manual compression. I also have an entire series, Audio 101, Episode 8, How to Use a Compressor. It is the nerdiest hour you will ever have understanding compression. I don't, I don't say that lightly, but you will come out of it understanding how compression works. It's very hard to do. It's very easy to screw up. So this would be more traditional. If we wanted to use a compressor, gate, expander to even out levels, this is how I would have done it in the past. And sometimes, frankly, I still do, uh, because I know how to do it quickly. Auto match, I use that more often. It just works, OK? So that's dialogue. So let's continue. Outside of auto match loudness, we then have the repair section. Now, you're not always going to need this, and we're going to actually revisit this uh, a little bit later in audition. But I still, I still can show you a couple of cool things. So there's noise, which includes our new um, noise reduction algorithm. How many of you have used this reduced noise in the previous Essential Sound? OK. So that was using something called our adaptive, uh, adaptive noise reduction. And if you used it before, you may recall that the noise reduction itself sounded OK. Notice again, it's a single slider here. The problem was is that it was adaptive, and it had to learn. So you'd kind of have, let's assume you had noise at the beginning of your file. You'd hear this, right? I see shaking blue heads. That's what it did. That was terrible. I'm not making a joke. It was terrible. I told the team, this is terrible. No one will use this. That doesn't make any sense. And every time it appeared on a clip, you'd hear, like every time. This is a brand new algorithm. It does not do that. It just eliminates noise. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to show you this real quickly. Now, again, this particular one, and it's impossible. These aren't super noisy clips. We'll get to some, again, a little bit later in audition. Um, but what I can show you is, so you have the same slider capability here. All right? So just go back to All the dialogue. All these, these questions about, like, oh, like, okay. single slider. Are you enough? Uh, what are you going to do with your life? You'll also find that you can when use I'm less. On that seam between society and the wild. Okay, it's about 2.4% there. Now, if you want to access all of the parameters of that noise reduction, you may also recall that adaptive noise had like 10 sliders, right? And which was very effective. The problem was is that most people are never going to use all those sliders because they didn't know what they, what they did. If you click on the Edit button inside the Effects Control Panel, so what's happening with Essential Sound is it is applying effects at the clip level, all right? All running in the background. So if you're new to this, you never have to, you never have to go here. You never have to touch this. You can just use a single slider. If you want the detail, click on Edit. What this now shows you is you're actually seeing all these, these questions about like, oh, I you know, this is, your, this is your effect now. But here's the amazing thing. It's actually controlled with a single slider still. So this is the percentage that we're actually using, 24%, which now also equates to 2.4. <laughs> this used to drive me crazy, because in the previous one, it didn't equate to the same value. So like 2.4 is actually 24% reduction. The other cool thing, and we're going to get into this more, is that you have five basic processing focus curves. Now, this is going to get a little nerdy, but this is really essential to understand. The default is what we call a broadband noise reduction curve, all frequencies. Now, traditionally, I wouldn't tell people to use this. Um, the truth is, with a newer algorithm, because you can use less, because it's less artifacted, it's actually pretty safe to use this. 
But the more you dive in, if you can identify where the noise is, and that's what these curves are showing you, when you see the red and blue paths crossing, that's showing you where that noise lives. You might hear, oh, you know what? It's actually a lot of like rumble, or just kind of, not, not necessarily hum, but some kind of right? So you can say only focus noise on the lower frequencies. Now why does that, why does that matter? Because artifacting typically happens in the mid-range. So if you don't touch or try and remove noise from the mid-range or the high frequency, you don't have any artifacts. So it gets rid of the but you have very clean sound. Then you have this curve, focusing on mid-frequencies. Now, frankly, removing noise from the mid-frequencies is very likely to incur some artifacting because this is where the fundamentals of the vocals are, right? So if you've got dialogue and you've got noise in the mid-frequencies, I'm not saying it's not going to take it out for you. It may very well. Just be prepared that you might have some slight artifacting. It's just, it's just how it is. This is why often we do ADR, right? This one, which I'm going to show you in audition, is actually my favorite. Uh, for years, actually here, I think two years ago, I gave a class where I talked about removing wind noise, right? The hardest thing to do because it's so random and because it occupies so many different frequencies. This curve, can you guess what this one does? I mean, it, t it tells you. <laughs> can you guess? Low and high. Low and high, thank you, sir. Throw something at you for winning, but um, all right. why does that? Why is that essential? It's also known as the 70s smile curve, right? Anybody who had a graphic EQ, so it focuses noise on the low end and the high end, but it scoops out the middle, which means it doesn't touch the vocals, which means you don't get artifacting. It removes the that's low end rumble of wind, and it also gets rid of the but it leaves the vocals untouched. So this is very good for wind noise attenuation, okay, reduction. Elimination, mm, maybe. By the way, this is 2018. It's also okay if someone is in a scene and they're outside to have some essence of the outside, right? I mean, I'm not trying, I, I didn't know that was funny, but yes. It's okay, well, no, and I say that because Anyone who's been doing audio for a while knows that even 10, 15 years ago, noise reduction was like, you take it all out or you failed, right? That's not the, not the case anymore. It doesn't sound good. So it's okay to leave a little bit. And then the last one here is focusing on higher frequencies, all right? So that's noise reduction. Now, in the case of uh, this particular uh, audio recording, there might be a slight amount of kind of low frequency hum. So this is where we can use the de-hum. Uh, I don't know how well we're going to hear it here because there's actually not too much low end in these speakers. But the same thing applies. It's a single slider. Um, this is based on where it was captured, right? So if we're in, the, in, in Europe and, and UK, 50 hertz, 50 cycle hum. Here in the US, 60 cycle. That's the default, all right? So same concept. So we can start at zero. All these, these questions about like, oh, like, are you enough? Uh, what are you going to do with your life? just a little bit, take a little bit of that edge off. And I know, because I've heard this on proper speakers, there was about, there was a little bit of 60 cycle hum, okay? Probably something like a ground lift that wasn't implemented on a lavalier mic, right? Sometimes you get this if you plug directly into a, a DSLR. It's faint. It may not really bother you, but that de-hum gets rid of it, all right? DS, there is a little bit of sibilance in here, so I might implement a little bit of DSing, Keep playing When here. I am on that seam between society beat as just me, me, not. All right, we're going to soften that. Let's go back here, play it again. I am on that seam between society and the wild. All right. It's loyal, wouldn't it? So DSing, getting rid of sibilance. Now again, you can go into the effects controls here. You have to click on a single clip to access the individual effects, by the way. Um, and you can choose your center frequency and your bandwidth, okay? Bandwidth is just that. It's the width of how many adjacent frequencies that sibilance is affecting. Now, I'm gonna tell you something else, and I said this to our audio team before. A 
center frequency of 3K, 3,300 hertz, is not the most ideal for sibilance. Sibilance really exists between 5.6 and 6.3K. That's where it's that, that thing that feels like it's cutting into your eardrum. 5.6, 6.3K, in that range. Now, you have all the harmonics there, so you have, it can go as high as 7, 7.5, seven it can go as low as 4, 3K. I like to place my center usually somewhere between 4,500 and 5K, right? And if it's really sibilant, and again, this is, this is, this is regional, it doesn't matter who's speaking, some, and it's often how it's captured, if it's really harsh, raise that center frequency so that it really focuses there and then shrink the bandwidth, okay? Wider bandwidth is just gonna, what, what's gonna happen if you widen the bandwidth? Anybody? Yeah, exactly, it's just gonna make it sound, it's, you're gonna start to lose some of the presence, okay? So the bandwidth I don't have a problem with at around 3000 hertz, but just keep in mind the center frequency default is around 3300. I typically find that if you move it up to around 5K, it just, it just takes the edge off, all right? And that's really what you're trying to do. And the wild. Let's just reselect all of these so I can do them globally. By the way, just if you didn't know that too, once you define what an audio type is, uh, you'll notice that when you've clicked away and nothing is selected, if you click dialogue, it selects all of your dialogue. Now, do you always want to make global changes to everything all the time? No. So it still works individually. You can say, oh, okay, just this clip needs some de-hum. Now we're only affecting this clip. But if we click away and then click dialogue, everything is selected so we can make a global change. Okay? All right. Okay, reduce reverb. We're going to cover that in Audition. Two more quick things in here that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, and I'm just going to reveal these to you. So EQ. We all know what equalization is, why we use it, right? To just bring out particular elements of our sound. We have uh, a couple of presets here that are kind of nice. Um, I kind of like the podcast voice one. It gives me a different perspective that I really value. All right, we can turn it off. We need nature to thrive. We yearn for these. We, we yearn back to in. be tested. And we're all going to be gone pretty soon, so how we spend our time really matters. All right. Just gives it, and you can actually see on the EQ curve here, it gives it a little boost in the upper mids and a little boost in sort of the lower mids, right? Um, that's usually somewhere between four and 800 hertz. Gives it a little bit of warmth, okay? Not to be confused with mud and muffle. Muddiness, muffling, that happens typically between 180 to approximately 330 hertz. So if you hear something where it's, it's, it's just kind of muffled like that, what you can then do is you can go into the effects here, all right, and we'll go to our EQ, and you could pull down these sliders right here, 125, 250. This is really where mud lives, muffling, really common, all right, especially if you've got windscreens on a microphone, um, just knowing where those frequencies are. Right. Unfortunately, Premiere does not have a frequency analysis real-time panel. Audition does, so we're gonna, I'll show you that when we get there. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all these EQ curves. You get the idea, all right? Presets, try them. Are all of them great? No, they are not. Uh, you know, we still have ones like on the telephone, <laughs> which is actually good if you're like mixing something. It's gonna be gone pretty soon, so how we spend our- That doesn't even sound very telephony, but they're, oh, it's still on podcast voice, that's why. Uh, or old radio, I think that one's like very, yeah, okay, so this kind of has the, let's see. It's gonna be gone pretty soon, so how we spend our time really. Yeah, you're like, oh, how kitschy and cool. Never gonna use that, but, um, <laughs> but uh, film editors, episodic TV editors, you do use things like on the telephone, right? Because that's the cutaway, right? Like I'm, now the shot's on me. Yeah, uh, James, I'll see you at five. It cuts to James, who's listening on the phone to me talking. Now I sound like... will be gone pretty soon, so how we spend our time really matters. Okay, right? It's the cutaway. So that's, that's useful. All right? By the way, this is mimicking an analog telephone curve. Who uses FaceTime? 
or S Skype. Okay. FaceTime and Skype now, they are full bandwidth, right? There's no more of that. It used to be called, uh, 15 years ago, in, in the record business, it, that was called the Britney sound. Because, do you remember all, all these big Britney Spears hits, they'd always have that little middle section where she'd be like, Okay, Justin, I think you're awesome. I'll see you tonight. Hit me, baby, one more time. Right? And then, whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Um, you get the idea, right? Okay. Enhanced speech. Don't use this. It's terrible. It doesn't sound good. It's bright. It's crispy. If you like it, good. Do what you want. I'm telling you right now, it's not great. Uh, ask me how I really feel. I'm telling you the truth. That's what I'm trying. I'm trying to tell you. And also, male, female? What does that even mean? I'm not making a joke. I don't know what that means. So just don't use that. You can, you can achieve the same and better sound just with EQ, okay? Don't get experimental with that, unless you want to. Creative reverb. Now, the benefits of this are, are multifaceted. We're not trying to necessarily put him in a reflective hall or something like that. There's a couple, of, there, well, there's many reasons why you use reverb on dialogue. Primarily, when you denoise something, a lot of times, you know, you take the essence or the ambience out of the space. So it's very nice to use something perhaps like, like a thicken or a warm room just to put that voice back into a natural space, right? So here, wait, let me do this. Let me do this across all of the, um, and I'll take off our telephone, our Britney voice here. I want to do this across all of the clips just so we have a little bit more to, to listen to. Go to reverb here, and we'll do something like warm room. Um, if it sounds too dry, if it sounds just too lifeless, just by putting some of that ambience back in, just a little, um, it just makes it sound a bit more natural. So we'll start out with nothing. What gives me hope is the fact that there are a lot of people doing good work out there. We tend to want to protect the places that we care about. So a commonality that like off. my documentaries have always had is On. society and the wild and how those two things interact. Okay. So again, he's in this big sort of cavernous place and when there's music underneath it, 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 it sounds almost, and if you hear this on a proper system, it, it sounds like it's overdubbed. It's not overdubbed, but because he was close mic'd and it was denoised, it's just, it's too dry. It doesn't sound natural, right? There's something wrong. You see he's in a big room. So just by using a little room ambience, can just warm it up and just put it back into that space. And again, if you're using any kind of noise reduction, this is, this is your friend. And there's, there's a bunch of really great variations, okay? We don't have to play them. It, auditorium, church, hall, these all have different characteristics. The other cool thing that I should note here is that this is in fact using our studio reverb, which is one of my favorites. Um, don't be, be afraid by all the sliders. This is really um, easy to use, easy to understand. And you also have additional presets in here. I highly recommend Room Ambience 1 and 2. Um, I made those a gazillion years ago. Um, I made most of these presets, actually, um, long, long time ago. It's just a way to get you started, OK, if you don't know. So modify them, play with them. Um, if you want more presence, a bit more sort of reflectivity, you want it to jump out a bit, early reflection will do that for you. If you want to make the room decay longer, you want it to be more echoey, that's what decay does. Um, if you want to simulate sort of a stereo kind of room, that's what width does. High frequency and low frequency cut, that's getting a bit nerdy, but again, different types of rooms have different frequency characteristics. Uh, halls, concert halls, typically are very warm and echoey, right? Not very bright. So they will usually have a high frequency cut of around four to 5,000 hertz, all right? In fact, I think if we go to our Great Hall. I love this preset. Sounds beautiful with like classical instrumentation. You can see it has a high frequency cut of 4K. That doesn't mean that nothing, you're not going to hear frequencies above that. It means that the reverb 
the echo won't have frequencies above that, okay? Which is nice, because when you have a lot of high frequency echoing, it gets echoey, all right? Similarly, low frequency cut, if you're gonna use any kind of reverb or room ambience, you, you typically want that above 150 hertz, meaning you're not gonna reverberate anything below 150, all right? Why? Because if you add echo and reverb to low frequency, that's how you get mud. That's how you get murky, unintelligible dialogue and music. So never add, re that's, I don't typically say blanket statements, except don't use that, but I mean, I don't typically say blanket things, but there's virtually, with the exception of sound design, where you're trying to make chaos sonically, that you want to reverberate low frequency, all right? Make sense? Okay. All right, and then the last thing here is clip volume, which is just that. It's just overall adding additional gain, which I think in, in Premiere is capped at 15 dB, yes it is, um, to one or more clips without having to do it on the clip itself, right? So you know you can also just come in here, right click and choose audio gain, right? In lieu of doing that, you can perform that right here, okay? So that is uh, Essential Sound in Premiere. Same thing applies um, in Audition. So let's segue over to Audition. So one of the things that I like to do is I, I typically um, do all of my mixing in Audition. And the best way to do it is from the Edit menu, go to Edit in Audition Sequence, okay? What this will do now is it will package up your entire Premiere Pro project, clips and all, and send it over to Audition non-destructively. I'm sure many of you have done this before. A couple of simple settings. Uh, we're going to select our entire sequence, or you can do the work area if you just want to work on a section. We're going to send our video through Dynamic Link, which means that as we're editing our sound in Audition, if we want to bounce back to Premiere and like maybe performance is a little laggy or stuttering, um, and you want to maybe turn off global effects mute, you do that, you go back to Audition, it reflects that because it's dynamically linked live, okay? So there's no rendering here, which means that this process is virtually instantaneous. You still do have an option to export a DV preview video. I mean, if you must. Not, and it's, it is, it's, it's like 720 by 480. So not super useful these days. Um, audio handles, absolutely, if you want more editing flexibility of your audio clips, assuming you have them. This is nice because if you have settings in Premiere that you've already done, essential sound or individual effects settings, it will transfer them non-destructively to Audition. Okay? So this is fantastic because you don't lose any of your work. Similarly, if you've already keyframed things in Audition, that stuff transfers too. Pan keyframes, volume keyframes, automation keyframes. All right. So let's go ahead and click open on this. All right, there we are. Notice it also even remembers the state. So I still have the dialogue soloed, okay, all of the other tracks. Something just worth pointing out, which is really cool in this latest release of Audition, which this is, but this session is an old session. Uh, if you go into the uh, track color controls, and I'll show you this in a minute. First of all, we have all new colors in Audition. It's very, very pretty. Uh, yeah, no, that's worth clapping for. It is really good. <laughs> Subtle clap. That was an 80s movie clap. Um, also, all of the colors that you have in Premiere now perfectly translate over to Audition. Before, they were kind of murky and dark. Um, it's all been redesigned. I don't know, you can't even really see here because it's an older session. I'll open new sessions for you, too. Um, we've done a lot of work on the UI. It's a lot faster. It's just more accurate in terms of what you're seeing. So again, here's everything that we just did as we left it. Yeah, I, it's weird. Like, I've, I've always struggled with self-doubt. By the way, you can see that the video was looking a little pixelated. Right? Because we're feeding the video into Audition Live. If I right-click, control-click, Audition also has the same fractional playback resolution settings as Premiere. I typically, when I'm editing my audio, 
I'm watching the video, but I'm listening to the audio. So I don't, I don't need to see, you know, especially in 4K or, uh, frankly, um, the last footage that we, sh in fact, the, sh the footage that I showed on day one was a mix of 4K, 6K, and 8K. So I don't, I don't need to see 8K while I'm like mixing dialogue. I'm not cutting it, I'm just mixing the dialogue. So if you're having any kind of performance issue, you can scale it down. And you saw the moment that you hit stop, it sharpens right back. Really, like, I've, just I've like always Premier. struggled with... Right? Um, so just to be aware of that. Also, uh, new in this version of Audition, actually since NAB, since April, you've also got a whole bunch of uh, time code settings as well. So if you are doing any kind of, I mentioned before, dialogue replacement, any kind of recording into an existing Premiere project, um, you can display the time code, you can display session or media time code. A lot of times, if you have an artist who's doing ADR, their, their cue sheet will reference the clip time code, not the session time code. So that's why we have those options there. All right, super cool. Okay, so um, we're gonna go back to Essential Sound for one second before we get into de-reverbing because I'm gonna talk to you about remixing your music. All right, so I'm gonna go into the Essential Video Mixing here. So this was the clip of music that they chose. And what you can see the editor did was it, the song ended and then he sort of tacked on another piece and just did a crossfade together to stitch it to make it a little bit longer. Um, if you're not an audio editor and you, get, you, know, you have a three minute piece of video and someone says, okay, I need the music to be three minutes and your music is two minutes and 10 seconds. You know, if you don't care about it sounding perfect, you can just sort of copy it and kind of listen and crossfade it and find it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but Remix in Audition does it automatically. You don't have to know anything about editing. You don't have to look for downbeats. You don't have to worry about bad edits. You don't have to worry about little clicks or pops or any of the things that you incur if you don't really edit well. And um, it's fully uh, editable adjustable, and it uses Sensei, which means, and it's actually machine learning, it it's always different. So you'll get a different edit on your music every time. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is just take out this little clip because we don't need it. Now, for whatever reason, again, this was not my clip nor my session, um, the music ends kind of rather abruptly here. All right, and then he has like some sound design down here. All right. So I'm thinking that I actually want this piece to end. To move you forward in your own life. I want it to end on that. Like that. That should be the ending. So now I'm going to show you a couple cool tips on how to remix and how to prep your audio for remixing. So I'm going to double click on this to bring it into the editor panel here. Now, as I said, this is my personal choice. You can do this however you like, but I want the music, I want this to actually be the ending right here. I want it to end right here. All right, like that. I want the ending to be right there. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm first gonna cut out the section that I don't need, all right? Now this has nothing to do with the remix part itself. I'm just showing you a cool little trick, a little tip. All right. Now, obviously that's going to end rather abruptly and it's probably going to have a little, some kind of digital click there. So we need to fix that. A couple things you can do. First of all, if you zoom in all the way down, you know, we have these non-destructive fade handles and you can just use the plus sign if you want. Or you can also do what I do, which is just select the edge here. And you can do a little cross a little fade like this and it shows you the curve that you're applying just so that it's smooth so you don't have that weird pop all right and it fixes that but also this section here it it we it needs it needs some decay because it's the end like it needs to sort of trail off right it needs some reverb but this is the end of the file so what i need to do is i need to add some silence first so i'm going to go up to edit insert silence now i'm going to add approximately Two seconds of silence, okay? Click OK on that. And then I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna select just the end, like this. Okay. 
Notice now that little pop is gone because I crossfaded the end. That's also known as, for all of you who've been in broadcast radio, topping and tailing. If you always fade in, fade out the ends of your audio clips, this edit was done by an amazing editor. Um, there were a bunch of audio edits in his dialogue where there's that little tick at the beginning and the end because they just sliced them. So if you want to fix that slicing, top and tail. And you can do it with these cool little handles. You only want to do this over a few samples. Don't, don't do this, right? <laughs> That's, that's 10 seconds. So zoom in so you know just a few samples. That's all you need. All right? So that's super cool, too. All right. Let's go up to Effects, Reverb, Studio Reverb. I told you I use this one all the time. I have two seconds of silence at the end. I chose a decay of around 2,000 2, milliseconds, which is about two seconds, 2.3 seconds to be exact. Um, High frequency cut. I think this is where mostly default settings and I just changed the decay. I'm going to set the dry to 100% so that everything that's already there stays the same level. And I'm going to set this wet setting to around 80%. So when I play this back, this little section, and you see the meters, how you could, I don't know if you can really hear it in here. Can you hear it? Can you hear it trailing off? It's very subtle in this room. You can see the meters, right? It's hard to hear in this room, but do you see that you're just going to have to believe me. <laughs> All right. You see the meters, right? If the audio stopped, it would be but it's going that's reverb. <laughs> Can't hear it in here. Further proof, I'm going to apply this, right? And you can see if we zoom in now, there's just a little tail. See? It's not a hard stop anymore. We have this little tail. Okay, that's all I wanted, just so that it's not so abrupt. Okay, so now we're going to get into remixing. What I'm first going to do is I'm actually just going to take this out of here. I'm going to put it back in so I know it's the exact length that I want of the original. I'm going to tell Essential Sound that this is music. Now, this is truly crazy sensei stuff that we're doing here. And I'm going to click on Duration. So remember, just like with Dialog, when you choose music in Essential Sound, it gives you things that you would typically use to process music in a video edit. So you have the same loudness auto match, right? You have auto ducking. So those of you who saw the Rush demo, right? Auto duck uses Sensei to automatically lower music against Dialog or whatever. It'll lower music against Dialog, other music, sound effects, ambience, or even things that aren't even tagged. It's, it's an AI, it's a machine learning engine. It understands, oh, there's something, when this something is happening, drop the music, okay? So we learned about ducking, you've got ducking in here. But we, what we wanna do is duration. And we're gonna choose remix. And what remix does is it dynamically recomposes any file. So this is not just something that you made in you know, Fruity Loops or you downloaded from Soundstream or what, it's, it's anything. It's, 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 it's Beatles, it's uh, Britney Spears. <laughs> I don't know why Britney's in my head today. Um, it's any kind of music. And now how we use it is we say, all right, well, how long is this timeline? Timeline is a minute and 46 seconds. Our clip is a minute 23. So instead, I'm going to type in I'm going to type in about a minute 44 because we've got a little bit of a tail on there. All right? Click enter. And when I do that, what you now see are these little wavy lines. These wavy lines are sections inside the music where it has automatically done the edit for you. And if you take a look, you can see that it is perfectly now at the edge. Yeah. <laughs> It's perfectly at the edge of your video. But what does it sound like? OK, well, I'll zoom in. Actually, I'm going to change the color, too, just so you can see it a little bit better. That's kind of nice, all right? Let's zoom in. And I'm going to solo it so that you, just, you can really hear the edits, OK? Here we go. Whoops. 
no, 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 that was not, that was not it. Wasn't it? What's happening? It's cutting out. That's not the clip doing that. There's no... You're kidding me, man. There we go, finally. Good grief. Okay, listen again. There's... It's not the clip! like having some weird thing. Okay, let's listen again. You heard the first one. There it is. There it is again. All right. Everybody wants to throw their laptop at some point in time. Okay, no. Right? Amazing. Um, this fundamentally changes the way we think about music editing because really it's, it's quite something. Now you may have seen, um, I have my properties panel open here and uh, what I'm going to do here, so I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll vary this up a bit. So let's say this needed to be two minutes and 47 seconds, okay? So inside the remix panel you see you have a couple different options, you have edit length. So you can say, by default, I want shorter edits to preserve more of the song's content. And if you take a look now, you see it's done a whole bunch of edits down here. Uh, and that's with shorter edits. If we go longer, all right, now you can see it did one over here. It did one right here. Let's zoom back out. Oh, and it only needed two that time. And it looks like it edited the front and the end together, but more seamlessly. All right, and somewhere in the middle, maybe we'll have a couple of more edits, right? It's always a little bit different. Yeah, here we have four edits, okay? Let's take a listen to some of these. By the way, you see how it's, it's recomposing. It's pretty much instantaneous. There's no, none of this, you know? It's, it's crazy. Now here's the amazing thing about this. Once it does that edit for you, if you right click, control click, go to remix, you have something here called split remixed clips into segments. And the reason why we give you that is because a lot of times people are like, okay, that's cool. What would be really cool though is if I could take that section and maybe put it somewhere else. Or maybe I want to take the edited pieces that it already defined as good edits and move them around. So if you do that, split into remix clip sections. Now, you have to, so it's a two-step process. You have to click away, and then, so what it does is it groups it. Just ungroup it. So now you can move these pieces around by themselves, right? So these are the edited sections. And what it's doing here, the magic behind it is that it's automatically doing the right crossfade at the right point in time, all right? This is, this is pretty sick. Like, you know, someone said when we first showed this a while ago, they're like, oh, should audio editors be scared? Well, no, because there's always things that need to be edited. But for users who don't want, that's not your thing. But you're like, I just need this to be three minutes, and I only have a minute 50, and my, my edits just aren't sounding musical. This is a lifesaver. So edit length, obvious. Um, features, the timbre, or the harmonic characteristics, OK? This too will produce different types of edited sections in your audio. If they're super rhythmic, right, a lot of beat, a lot of downbeat, um, I say focus more on timbre. Um, there's also minimum loop. So a lot of times we use, especially for YouTube videos, right, it's, it's just sort of beat music, right? Strong beat. So you can say, okay, I, I don't want any edit shorter than eight beats. One, two, three, four, two. It'll never make an edit shorter than that, right? Or you can say, no, this is like a uh, lo-fi chip tune, so I want, you know, and those, those things kind of go pretty long. So, all right, no, I want 32 beats as my minimum, all right? And it'll recompose that, okay? So it's, it's really, really powerful 
Um, you also have this thing here called maximum slack. Now the reason for that is because sometimes when it's editing, it might, you notice how what I said, like, okay, our video was 146 and I told it to edit to 144. That's because sometimes if it's going to edit on that beat, your tempo may not fit into 146. So the edit's going to be perfect, you know, but the film ended a second ago. So this maximum slack says, okay, don't make it any longer than that. Now, you have this checkbox here, stretch to exact duration. So you're probably thinking, well, why wouldn't you always want that checked? I have my video at two minutes, I want my audio to be two minutes. If you choose stretch to exact, it is not using the remix algorithm, it's going to use our stretching algorithm. Let me rephrase that. It's using the remix, but it's using our stretching algorithm, which means it's going to modify sonically the content. I don't recommend doing that, okay? It's not gonna sound as good, right? So if you really want it remixed, just adjust the duration a little bit shorter, okay? That's, that's, a, that's a user tip, because it, it, you just don't know. Does that, do you understand what I'm saying about that? Does that make sense, right? Like, based on your tempo, if you, if you make it the exact duration, that downbeat, it might be 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds later in time. So it's gonna put that downbeat in there, but it might be 20 milliseconds later. So just make your target a little bit shorter so that it compresses everything better and edits it differently. The other cool thing about this is um, that while this does amazing things with beat-based music, this also works with sort of more freeform ambient soundtrack, underscore. So my colleague Michael Shez and I, who runs Adobe Live, we did a thing where um, I composed all this kind of underscore where it was just cellos and creepy, uh, what's that uh, film, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, does anybody remember that? And the dude was a film composer and he hates his life because he's like, I, you know, someone's like, what do you do? I make dark, ominous, slow tones, you know. <laughs> right, just kind of, there's no melody or anything. This works with that too. Um, the thing is, it doesn't necessarily know the best parts of a song that you want. So that's why splitting into segments is very useful, right, so you can move things around. A lot of people ask, well, what if I want like the first, the first chorus three times? It doesn't know what your chorus is, not yet anyway. It, it, I mean, I'm just being honest, it doesn't know yet. It knows where the beat divisions are, and it knows how to edit them so that you don't clip anything, but it doesn't know like, oh, I love the third chorus the best. So you may need to play around with your sliders or, again, separate it into those sections, you know, make your edit lengths as short as possible so that you have even more bits that you can then cut and move around. All right? Question? Quick question. Hmm, okay. Yeah, so that was, okay, again, that was using a stretch, the question was there used to be some preset for fixed durations. That was using the stretch algorithm. So what that does is it just, without changing pitch, it speeds up or slows down based on those durations, right? That algorithm didn't sound as good doing that, so hopefully we see remix in Premiere. That's, that's on the roadmap. Okay, yeah, all right, so that you don't have to go to audition. I, I like it better because there's more analysis tools. Speaking of frequency analysis here, um, which you can find under the window menu, this is something which I use all the time. This is, uh, just as you use your scopes in Premiere, frequency analysis is, is really useful if you're trying to identify, you know, and, and one, problems, but two, just to see sonically sort of how things are playing well together. I don't, okay, I, I changed my our, uh, amplitude here. But you get the idea. So you have this full spectrum frequency analysis of your music, right? You just see some bass kicked in right here, resonating around 70 hertz. You're not even hearing 16K right here, but there's some 16K in there. And then your piano, it's all right here, right? All the mid-range of the notes of the piano. You're seeing the individual notes and their individual frequencies, okay? Again, you can go to my Audio 101 on YouTube learn all about how to read that, how that works. Frequency analysis is way easier than Lumetri scopes.
to be completely honest. I mean, it, right? Yeah, I know. Audio nerds are like, no, it isn't. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's way easier. OK. And I can say that, because I'm one of them. Yeah. OK. Uh, noise, wind noise, and de-reverb. Here we go. And then we're going to get on to export. And then I've achieved all the things I wanted to show you today. And we have 26, we have 20 minutes left. OK. So are we good on essential sound and remixing? What do we think? Cool? OK, thank you. Thank you. I, I, honestly, if you, haven't, if you haven't tried it yet, if you've kind of gotten into it a bit but weren't quite sure, it's, uh, it's really great. And um, even I these days, when I'm doing quick YouTube things, uh, quick YouTube things, that's what I do. I don't bother going back to Audition. I just do it in Premiere, Essential Sound. I have my own little compressor preset in Dynamics. Uh, I have Auto Match that I can leverage, and uh, everything else is kind of just there. OK. So I'm going to pull up two files here, and I'm going to pull up a wind noise file. A wind noise file that I've been using for so long, but it just, it just kind of does it. And um, it was real, which is essential. It wasn't faked. Okay. I don't remember which one I want to use here. I'm going to open both of these. OK. So let's start with the, um, let's start with first uh, D-Reverb. Show you two examples here. Make this a little bit louder. OK, so I recorded this uh, today in a uh, small, rectangular, wallpapered room. Okay, I'm going to use the effects rack here to apply the D-reverb, which we're going to find under noise reduction, D-reverb. You have the same D-reverb in Adobe Premiere Rush, by the way, which is really, really amazing. Um, let's take a quick listen first to what, uh, what this original thing sounds like. This is an example of another type of echoey reflective room, this time a little boxier perhaps, uh, treated wallpaper with um, uh, a rectangular shape. And this is exactly the kinds of things where... Okay, so you can hear that, right? You can also hear me, like there's some going on. This is not going to fix the in there. Um, but what it is going to do is it's going to take out that boxy decay that you're hearing, right? That sounds like, and that's actually what it was, right? Voice recorder on the table, right? You do an interview with someone, or sometimes you're just trying to capture an omnidirectional sort of thing. That's what that is in a rectangular, boxy, wallpapered room, AKA conference room, all right? So once again here, inside D Reverb, notice it looks just like the D Noise. Um, you have your five EQ curves here, just like D Noise, and then you have your single slider. Now, I'm going to use the default, all frequencies, and maybe we'll s go through them and see what works best. There's also a bit of AI in here as well, because when you move, remove or attenuate the reverb, the decay, well, you're removing a lot of frequencies, right? So naturally, what happens is if you take frequencies away, just like with EQ, it is also bringing down the volume of whatever is there. So the AI here is performing an intelligent auto gain to maintain the same loudness, which is really cool. Because traditionally, um, while there's never been any really perfect de-reverb algorithms, I've always done it with a mixture of gating and EQ, and then I'd have to use a compressor afterwards to push it forward. This kind of does it all in one step, OK? This is not going to solve every problem. This is not going to automatically take something that, like I said, is so echoey and make it perfect. What it can do is make something better, something that you'd feel more comfortable broadcasting, particularly like in a YouTube video. How many YouTube videos have you seen where a lot of people use the capture mic on like a C920, right? All those lo cool Logitech cams. And they're here. So you know, there's three feet of distance. It's their room. Um, and it's got that, that room echo, which is just annoying, right? This is great for that. It's really good for that. That's not to say that there are no artifacts when using this. So it can happen. You're removing a lot of frequencies here, but it really does suck out that decay. And you just got to play around with it. So let's go ahead and do that. Start. 
start, and I'm going to start moving our slider here. And hopefully this is pretty, uh, we're trying to remove echo from a file in an echoey room. So this should be very effective. But hopefully you'll hear it. This is an example of another type of echoey reflective room, this time a little boxier perhaps, uh, treated wallpaper. Okay. Okay. Let's turn it on now. Treated wallpaper. Okay, that's way too much. Echoey reflective room, this time a little boxier perhaps. Okay, so here's before. Echoey reflective room, this time a little boxier perhaps. Echoey reflective room, this time a little boxier perhaps. Okay. Maybe we do a little bit of uh, high and low on this. Let's try it over here. Uh, a rectangular shape, and this is exactly the kinds of things where... You can where see if you get too much... Deep reverb can just improve the sound a little bit when you don't have direct voices right on my... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so echoey in here. It's like, it's sort of hard to demonstrate in this very big curtained airplane hangar that we're in. showing this. Um, can you hear what it's doing though? Yeah. All right, that one's, see that's subtle. So subtlety, not gonna work. Let's do this one. This was in my shower this morning. Clothed. I mean post shower is what I mean, not in the shower. Well, I'm standing in, anyway. You know what I mean. Maybe you don't. After I took a shower, I brought the iPhone, no, that's all bad. All right, anyway. What does a shower sound like? Here's, here's, this is all going wrong. Here, take a listen. So this is kind of a perfect example of the sorts of things that you might want to try and attenuate. Okay, so that's the shower. Shower is tiled, shower is bright, shower is reflective. Not that you record videos in the shower, but again, think of conference rooms, think of, uh, I just helped a friend work who's doing a documentary and they're like shooting stuff in a kitchen. And there's a lot of just, um, not for mica, that's very 80s, but uh, like uh, tiled and granite surfaces that are bright and reflective, okay? Um, any bright reflective surface. So this can really help to just attenuate some of that. So I'm going to go extreme so you can hear it, what it's doing, but you'll get the idea, okay? So take a listen. So this is kind of a perfect example of the sorts of things that you might want to try and attenuate Echo or reflection. Uh, uh. So you're thinking, all right, it doesn't really sound different. I'm going to turn it back off. So this is kind of a perfect example of the sorts of things that you might want to try and attenuate. Echo or reflection. And you can really hear it where I say attenuate. Listen now. And attenuate. All right, so you really hear that decay. Let's put it back in. And attenuate. Can you hear the T was tighter? I'm, he I'm hearing the T. All right, okay, so you get the idea, all right? You understand I can't really show you de-reverb in an echoey room. All right, this makes no sense. <laughs> this won't solve everything, but it's, it's, really, um, it's really good. It's the best one out there that I've heard, is all I can tell you. The other great example where I've actually used this when we were playing around with it was uh, we did a, a shoot, I do a lot of like pro bono, regional shoots where I live, and uh, the lav batteries died. So fortunately, we had the camera still capturing, and it was, uh, we were using, I think, um, it's either 24 to 70, pretty, pretty tight, or may have been an 85, I can't remember. But we weren't very far back is what I'm getting at. So there wasn't an enormous amount of distance. But as everybody knows, mirrorless, DSLR, the on-camera mics are not, they're not great. They're, they're for reference, right? They're, you're, that's why you're doing a secondary capture. So we had a secondary capture because the batteries failed in the lab, so we lost the last minute of the interview, and we had to edit the two together. So there was a whole EQ component there that was trying to match them, that's separate, but it was just that the lab is very dry, and the, the camera one is very wet. So I was able to remove enough of the room and then add a little room to the lav mic to balance them out so that they sounded similar. And then once you put music underneath it, 
no, no one knows. And then once you compress it and then make an MP4 and then upload it to YouTube, it sounds amazing <laughs> because you can't hear any of those artifacts anymore anyway. So again, it's for like saving the day. Um, I know many of you, I'm sure, do in-house recording. It's really great for those things. Boom mics, right? You're always maybe a little too high, a little too far away. You just get too much of that room ambience. The best areas where it works really successfully is when you have, you know, just, a, just enough of room, no, room tone where it's annoying, right? You always want to capture separate room tones so that you can keep it in the background. But if there's too much on the direct sound, you, you don't want it to be echoey because then it just doesn't sound pro. Um, that's where that's great. I mentioned the, the YouTube talking, you know, iSight camera. I do tutorial videos. Now I do them on a proper condenser mic, but I used to do them just with the in, internal mic on the Mac. Um, it's echoey because it's omnidirectional. Omnidirectional decay attenuation, that is perfect for the D-reverb, all right? Okay, so second to last thing before we get into uh, export is wind noise. And this is going to leverage, again, the same denoise that we had in Premiere. I don't know how great you're going to hear this because we don't have a lot of bass coming out of here. Um, this is where I pull up frequency analysis because what you'll see is that this has all the components that I was talking about. It's got a lot of low-end rumble. How do we know that? Well, you can see that we start capturing frequencies at around 40 hertz. And then right around 100 hertz, there's just a lot, of, a lot of noise energy down there, all right? And then, oh, I'm zooming back out here. And then as you can see here, it goes all the way up to around 10K. Well, you can actually, you can actually hear that, some of that rumble in there. That's, that's impressive, okay. Here's just the rumble. Okay, you can't really hear it, but you can see it. Oh, you can hear a little bit of it, all right? Right, you can see it's all in this range down here. Not here, right? Here's your mid-range. We're not selected, none of that. All right here. So this kind of has all the elements that are so difficult to remove. So denoiser. Let's just start with the focus on higher and lower, OK? Wind this back. I'm going to play this for you first. This was from a Dutch broadcaster. It's given to me probably, <laughs> I think my first or second year at Adobe, like 16 years ago. <laughs> Get a new demo file, perhaps? I don't know. I don't record outside in the wind. I don't know. Uh, this doesn't happen. I live in Arizona. There's no wind there. It's hot. I can record in heat. The overstroming gaf de doorslag. De Zuiderzee moest droog. Werd begonnen met de afsluitdijk. Okay. Now, again, this is... This is a one slider fix. If you want to learn more about how to do this, I've got a YouTube video about it. Um, and I've done a bunch of live streams on it, which you can find on facebook.com slash Premiere Pro. Okay? So hundreds and hundreds, I live stream almost every day of the week. Uh, I will resume again next week. Um, so you can find how to remove wind noise on Facebook on our Premiere Pro uh, video, uh, video tab. There's a lot of things that you can do to improve things. This one, as it was, it's just not, we wouldn't broadcast this. It's just too much going on. So I'm trying to show you the benefits here with a single slider are that you can actually get pretty close pretty easily. All right? So we'll check it out. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. The Zuiderzee moest droog. Oh, sorry. Maybe it would be good if I turned it on. That usually helps. Okay. It werd begonnen met de afsluitdijk. En op 28 mei 1932... Smiddags. Okay, let's wind back a little bit. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. The Zuiderzee moest droog. Werd begonnen met de afsluitdijk. Now you're thinking to yourself, holy cow, you're at like 90%. Yeah, but it's not touching the middle. So notice we're not getting those swishy swirlies that you typically hear with 100% noise reduction because we're not touching that area. So let's just go to 100 just to, again, I'm overdoing it because I'm not hearing it very accurately here, but we're going to do before. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. De Zuiderzee moest droog. And after. De overstroming gaf de doorslag. Am I hearing de more noise now? What's happening? What's going on? Moest droog. Werd begonnen met we de afsluitdijk. 
en op 28 mei. Okay, so I'm going to apply this, and then I'm going to take another one here. This is a little, no, not deep reverb. And I'm going to add just a separate one, just for the low end, okay? Just to handle that low end rumble. Let's try this. So we can stack these. 1932, smiddags om 2 minuten over 1, werd op deze plaats onder getoeter van de sleepboten en gejuich van de dijkwerkers het laatste. Anybody speak Dutch? No? Okay. <laughs> All these years, I really don't know what he's talking about. Okay. All right. So in any case, it's very hard for me to really adjust this, but this is what I recommend. It's not coming as clearly as I would like, and I don't quite know why. Um, this is what you want to use for something like wind, okay? When I first played it, we weren't hearing it, now I'm hearing it. But it's scooping out the mids, focusing on lows and highs. You can stack them. Sometimes that's a better way to do it. Sometimes it's nice to have more control over the highs and or mids. This does have some mid-range noise, so uh, again. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. But now you see. The Zuid Zee moest droog. You can hear the middles getting kind of murky, so uh, you can do a separate pass of low, a separate pass of high. This one typically is doing it, so I would recommend trying that first with wind. Um, outside of that, the manual way of doing it, if we want to just go there for a second, and I can, I think I, I've got three minutes, so I think I can show you this real quickly. Okay, hold on, I'm going to change my workspace to classic. I need, I need more real estate. Okay, here's the, here's the classic way of doing it. We come over here, and we make a selection of just the low end rumble, which we can't even hear right now, okay? Like this. I'm going to say capture noise print, Noise reduction, noise reduction process. I'm do like 82%. I'm going to do 40 decibels of reduction, zero degree of spectral decay. Select the entire thing, apply it like that. It takes out all the rumble, all the rumble, but leaves the low end fundamentals of his voice. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. The Zuid Zee. Before. Yeah. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. And after. Redo. Okay. The Zuid Zee moest droog. Okay. Now what I would do is I would, oh wait, 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 don't clap yet, I'm not done. So I'm gonna come in here. Now I can see the mid-range, right? Color is amplitude, so it goes to about 10K. Really though, where it's like reddish orange, it's about, it's, what is that, about 4K? So let's go to around seven here, okay? Same thing, capture noise print, effects. You'll be able to watch this back, by the way. Noise reduction, process, select entire file. Now I'm going to use a little bit of spectral decay. What that does is rather than subtract, it simply attenuates. I'm going to take my slider here. Let's play this back a little bit. Select everything. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. The Zuid Zee moest droog. All right, apply that. Okay. And now we've got this little bit of high end wispiness that I don't like in there. Let's go ahead and take that out as well. Take our sample, capture noise print, effects, noise reduction, noise reduction. Select the entire file. Let's back this off to around 50%. Let's do around 20 amps of, de of deduction. Apply like this. And now you have, we went from this. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. To this. The overstroming gaf the doorslag. The Zuid Zee moest droog. All right. So that was super fast. Okay, lastly, exporting. Export file. What do you want to export to? I just dealt with this with someone moments ago. If you are going to be working on your audio, it's very simple. There's no, there's no magic here. Um, if you're going to keep working on your audio, always use WAV PCM. But I like AIF. Use AIF then. That's fine too. WAV just works everywhere. It holds all of your metadata. It's a standard in 16, 20, 24, 32 bit, 32 bit float. It's just, it's just the best choice. Should you use FLAC? It's a lossless codec. Yes. Yes, you can use it in production. Yes, it's a little smaller than WAVE. But if you're going to continue working, always work in WAVE PCM. MP3 should be the last step, and of course MP3 is going away. AAC, that's becoming the new MP3 standard. You can access all of these here on Mac and Windows. Um, Monkeys Audio, again, these are like trade formats. ZIF AUG, that's like old school. MP2 is for broadcast. The key is, if you're going to be Continuing to work, always choose WAV PCM or AIF. These are uncompressed file formats. They'll retain all of your frequency components. They're going to retain all the bit depth, all the information that's in there. 
I just, I really emphasize wave PCM because this also applies to BWF, which is broadcast wave. And one of the greatest things about Audition and why we became a standard in the broadcast industry is because we support all of the various, um, not only BWF broadcast wave metadata fields, ID3 for MP3, IXML, RIF and CART for um, broadcasters here in the US, but of course the XMP standard, which translates to all Adobe applications, all right? Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be sticking around for a couple of minutes. We are right on time here if you have any questions. And enjoy your final day of Max. Thank you.